of July, my wife and I were driving to Texas for the very first time. And we, uh, we kind of chuckled about that phrase, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as soon as I could. That was 27 years ago, and I, when I got into Texas, I realized that even though I had lived in Florida, that really wasn't Dixie. That really wasn't the real South. We lived in a retirement community surrounded by people from New York and Michigan and places like that. And the vocabulary was very familiar to me. But when I got to Texas, things shifted a little bit. Instead of the word thing, I would hear the word thang. It took me a while to adjust to the southern draw. Instead of fire, it was far. And instead of the oil business, it was the all business, right? And so you know what I'm talking about. It even extended into church language. One of the first times um, that I had a chance to preach, one of the gentlemen from the congregation in Fort Worth came up to me and said, how do you like that new pool pit? Pool pit? What's a pool pit? He said, you know, that thing that you stand in when you preach, that's a pool pit. Oh, a pulpit. Okay. It took me a while to become no longer a Yankee and be accepted in Texas. Words matter. And sometimes just little words matter. Even one word matters. And that's what our text for tonight says. Isaiah 49 verse 2 says, He made my mouth like a sharp sword. Who's saying those words? Those words are coming actually through the prophet Isaiah, but they're talking about Jesus. Jesus' mouth was like a sharp sword. If we look back in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4, it says this. It says, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Again, speaking of the one who would come, the servant king, that with his mouth and with his lips he would slay people. This is a powerful word. We see from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 this, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power and demolish stronghold. Strongholds. These strong words that God has given to us demolish strongholds. That's the power of a simple word from Jesus. It's an interesting thing. The Isaiah is speaking into a world where Cyrus had kind of freed the people of Israel by military power. And yet he's saying one is going to come who's even stronger than this Cyrus character who could free you. And he's saying he's not going to come with tools like military power, but he's going to come with a simple tool, a seemingly almost innocuous tool, a tool that seems feeble in comparison. And yet, as we look through the scriptures, we see many passages that say how powerful God's word actually is. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says this, Grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. The word of God stands forever. In Isaiah 55, a very famous passage, verses 10 and 11, it says this, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven... So it is with my word. It will bud and flourish and yield seed into the sower. So my word, which goes out from my mouth, will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish everything that I have purposed it for. God's word accomplishes mighty things. Nations bow at a simple word. God tells us that his word is indeed powerful. When God speaks things happen. When God says something, it happens. Maybe you're a parent, and maybe you remember a day when you would say, clean, and somebody would hop to it and clean their room. Or maybe you remember them going, oh, rolling their eyes. But with God, it doesn't work that way. When God says something, it comes to pass. 
on the way driving around today, you probably saw, saw some stop signs, and hopefully you came to a full three-second complete stop. That's how it works. There are words that cause us to action. You see a statement come in the mail, and it says, Bill, do now. Do now. And so what you do is you go write your check or send your online payment. It only takes a simple phrase to move us to action. The people of Israel had been in Babylon for a while. They had been dispossessed from their land by brutal means. Their king had watched his sons been murdered in front of him. His eyes were gouged out and they were laid, um, they were taken to this faraway land 700 miles from their home. All they knew was defeat and despair. It says this, this was kind of their mantra of the day from Isaiah 40 verse 27. It says, my ways are hidden from my God and he has disregarded me. That was how people of Israel felt in that day. They felt disregarded by the Almighty, set aside, not paid attention to. Maybe some of you have felt that way recently. The stock market crashed and you were like, where's God in this? You're fearful of an unknown enemy, COVID-19. Where's God in all of this? You feel isolated, locked into your home. Where's God in all of this? Maybe you've experienced abandonment or divorce in the past. Maybe you've lived some kind of a nightmare. Then you can relate to the people of Israel in Babylon. These exiles turned in moments to fleeting gods. They tried everything. It says in Isaiah 56, 12, and you can look it up. I'm not making this up. Isaiah 56, 12, it says, Come, let us go get some wine and drink our fill of beer. What are they trying to do? They're trying to numb out. They're trying to say, you know what? We're in a bad situation and all we got is the liquor store open. And that's what they're putting their hope in. That maybe if they're lucky, they can just survive this. Despair and gloom were strong upon the people of Israel during that day. They felt like God had hidden himself from them. They were disregarded and enter the voice of one who speaks a strong word. One word, one word from him can change everything and set things right. And he does. And he has a whole bunch of different words during his earthly life. Like right after his baptism, he's led out into the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil. And he says this, just one word in Greek, gegraptia, gegraptia. You know what it means? In English, it's three words. It is written. And with one little word, gegraptia, Satan has to flee. Why? Because Jesus knows the word deeply in him. Jesus sees a leper, and in English it says, be clean. But in Greek, it's one word, katharistia. Just one word, be clean and they are clean. Jesus and his disciples are out in a boat one night, and all of a sudden, the wind and the waves, the tempest rises, and Jesus stands up with one word, saiopa. Saiopa means be quiet. One word, and the whole world changes. Those were all small compared to the climactic word of Jesus' life. Jesus' life before the resurrection ended in this one word, tetelestai. It is finished. The work is done. And my friends, we find ourselves in that story today. The work of God has been completed. Yes, things are swirling around us like crazy. It's a new reality that we live in. And I haven't figured it out, and you haven't figured it out. And that's okay. To tell us, die. It is finished. You are good with him now and forever. His death for your life, his sacrifice that you might celebrate, that is what he has given to us. One little word. 
to tell us die. It is finished. The completion of all of the Old Testament, everything that was ever prophesied and foretold and prefigured, it's now done, complete, finis. Everything is done. The serpent has been crushed. Death has been laid low. The lamb has been slain. Atonement has been made. The Passover is complete. The banquet is ready. Oh, I long for that day that we get to once again share the banquet together, a foretaste of the feast that is to come, that is the Lord's Supper. And we'll talk more about that on Sunday. To tell us, I means this for you and for me. We're forgiven, we're washed, we're cleansed, we're justified, we're loved, we're made new, we're born over. God has sealed it with water, and he sealed it with bread and wine, and he brings us to a place of restoration, a place of healing, and we long for those things. It was brought about by his blood, to Tetelestai, it is finished final restoration is yet to come we have one more word in revelation chapter 21 verse 6 it's gegonian gegonian it means this it is done let me read it to you revelation chapter 21 verse 6 or 5 and 6 he says this and he was seated on the throne and he said i am making everything new this is right before jesus comes back i am making everything new write down these words for they are trustworthy and they are true he says it is done it is done gegonan i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end, to him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. My friends, we find ourselves between Tetelestai and Gegonan. Those simple words have fallen the evil foe, which we now sing back to God, a song of triumph. No one can fell him. The final line of verse 3 of a mighty fortress is our God. One little word will fell him.